Um, thank you very much um, for the opportunity. Um, it's my pleasure to present this work here, and in particular, I think, well, I, well, to, okay, I, this is a joint work with um, Dr. Jinghua Wang from Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics, um, starting from um, March 2014. It becomes a, like, since then, it becomes a painful, painfully interesting adventure for us. So this work, uh, this problem itself was suggested by Lars Anderson. When he suggests the problem to us, he, uh, the plan is do it for uh, under the wave coordinate gauge. And Lars also provide us the correct reference. And, but it's our common decision to do it under max, maximal foliation gauge. So I will talk about this um, work under maximal foliation. So uh, let's first write down the equation. So this is, uh, I'm going to, uh, well, f first, consider three plus one space time, where this m is a four dimensional manifold, and this g is the Lorentz metric, has the, such a signature. And I write down the Einstein uh, equation with massive scalar fields, and Einstein tensor is equal to the stress energy tensor. And the stress energy tensor for scalar field, massive scalar, for the scalar field uh, takes this form. If um, the m is zero, uh, that's massless scalar field. And today we'll talk about the case that m equals one. Um, well, here, Ricci is the space time Ricci for the metric of g, um, and this r is the uh, scalar curvature. It's a common convention. Um, so if you do just a simple conservation law and then you actually get um, einstein klein gordon equation directly from the first page. So um, this has two equations. The second line is the equation for the metric, and the first line is the equation for the scalar field, which is a klein gordon equation in the curve of the space-time. And, uh, well, certainly, if you write down the equation system, you first ask if there is a solution. You can immediately spot one solution which is very non <laughs> very uninteresting. You have phi equals zero and Minkowski space being the trivial solution of the equation system. So, um, well, first, I mean, certainly we are aiming at construct global in time non-trivial solution of the equation system. Uh, well, because it's going to be uh, a bit <laughs> uh, heavily, uh, heavily rely on commuting vector field approach. So I will first start with the simplest case to introduce some notation and um, some, fun, uh, <coughs> some basic concept. Okay, so let's start with um, the linear wave equation in three plus one space time. And, oh, I, okay, so um, box M phi means the, uh, uh, means the Laplace Beltrami operator relative to Minkowski metric. And, this is a linear wave equation, and what it's a simple, simple exercise to derive the decay estimates by one, two, three, three method. So, like representation formula, which is the Kirchhoff formula in physical space time, and the second thing is you can use Fourier transform, and the third thing, which is the thing that I'm going to talk about uh, a lot today, which is uh, where you have a set of invariant quantities, which are energies, generalized energies, in, induced by killing and conformal killing vector field in Minkowski space-time. And due to this conserved quantity and by the Sobolev inequality connected to this uh, set of quantity, which is due to Kleinman, you can actually direct to get the decay estimate for phi. I didn't say that <coughs> you assume this uh, is, that the data is, smoothly com uh, is smooth and compact support. Okay, so what I'm going to, next page, I'm going to write down all this killing and conformal killing vector field. So, um, so they are, uh, first line is translation. The second line is the generator of the Lorentz group, um, which consists of two parts. One is the rotation on the sphere, and one is the space-time rotation, which I put a red uh, font, which is going to play a crucial role today. And the third thing is scaling vector field, and the last line is, um, the, uh, is, for, is the uh, inverted translation vector fields. And K0 is what I'm going to use, uh, Moravis vector field. 
So I would call the first three line commuting vector fields, and the last line I would just use k zero. Okay. So um, you looking at you're looking at a vector field and how to use that. Basically, you are using it in two ways. The first way is I mean I'm taking the first three lines called a set of vector field to be z, and due to the nice property which is in this line, you can throw this z through the box. <laughs> Keep throwing. Okay, so um, it, you regard this z as the first differential operator. What did you get? You get many many derivative of phi. So in this way, you actually can control energy. Um, I mean, in terms of this commuting vector field, and this is one thing. Uh, okay, so and this two box only hold for uh, z equals s. Otherwise, every other vector field actually commute directly. Um, so um, the other role that vector field might play uh, is this uh, multiplier. Okay, so um, it's the it's the vector field that you are going to pair with the energy momentum and um, the typical multiplier that played cru crucial <coughs> role in uh, where the thing that we are going to talk about is the um, Marvis vector field. So I wrote, uh, well, I modified some, uh, up to this modification, I wrote briefly um, what this multiplier can give you. It gives you a set of nice L2 estimates about phi and uh, commuting vector field. Uh, acting on F L2 norm of that. So, um, okay, so what can we get? Um, actually, what, no, sorry, I'm going to first introduce this null frame and optical function so that I can say something about this. Uh, I'm going to um, also, uh, well, I think some of, some of you are very familiar with all these sorts of things. Um, partial T and the partial R, R is uh, here. And the partial t is the uh, standard um, time coordinate. Uh, uh, L bar is the uh, partial t minus partial r, and uh, Laplace slash i is the um, Cartesian component of the spatial covariant derivative on the sphere. So you can write it in local coordinate in this way. And um, the optical function u is defined to be t minus r, and u bar is t plus r. So um, if you use multiplier and use the full set of the commuting vector field, what you can obtain from uh, Kleinman Sobolev and invariance. Invariant quantities is the whole set of, this set of uh, decay estimate. So basically, you initially have this decay rate, which include this one plus t decay and, and together with the decay relative to um, you, is the quantity depositing the point to the causal boundary. So, um, and based on this z phi estimates, you do some calculation and you find, okay, I have some uh, better, more detailed decay behavior for just the generic derivative on phi and for some better direction, better in the sense that it is tangential to the cone, which has two directions, two type of direction. One is L over there and um, the angular derivative. And along this better direction, you have better decay. Um, so, okay. Well, certainly you are not satisfied with using that for linear wave. Then we look at um, what this thing um, um, originally uh, is for. So, um, the, for uh, three, uh, for glo uh, that, that was originally for doing global solution for cosine linear wave equation for small data for higher dimension, and you basically use Sobolev, uh, with use Kleinman Sobolev, that's done. And then, uh, well, for three plus one, you don't typically expect a global existence. You have to assume the nonlinearity has certain structure. This structure is called null condition, which was uh, proposed by Kleinman in 82. And then, uh, okay, so I, I write down the more detailed structure. is some smooth function multiple of a span of canonical null forms. And this uh, the first line of the null form is uh, the Minkowski contraction. 
and the second one is the anti-symmetric structure. So um, if the equation, a cosine linear wave equation satisfy null condition and you have uh, global existence for small data. This is the result by uh, Chris Dudulu and Kleinman independently um, done in 86. So uh, let's talk about um, if you're looking at an equation which doesn't have the null condition in 3 plus 1, um, you, you can see blow up happening. So here are two equation, two examples. Uh, well, the thing is, you can reduce them to typical um, equations, which ha is about to, which definitely is blowing up, even for small data. So the first one is Riccati, and the second one is Berger's equation. So, um, but there are things in between. So you don't see now condition uh, in the nonlinearity, but you still have the hope of having the glue. Glu global solution. Um, this was uh, described by uh, Linda Blatt-Ronyansky, which is called weak null condition. Uh, how do you detect this? So if you write down, uh, decompose a uh, wave equation relative to the null coordinate and eliminate this uh, angular derivative um, and also the be better derivative L, and what remains the, is the asymptotic equation or equation system. If such equation, equation system has global solution, uh, or I mean modulus, ignore what I'm writing, then it it's satisfies weak null condition. So I will, in the next page, I will list um, examples for uh, weak null condition. Well, the first one is very simple, and you look at the first equation, and this equation uh, well, it looks like you have a, s a square of partial t, and this is partial t v square, but v is very good. So this actually, uh, if you write down the asymptotic uh, system and then solve, you actually have global solution, and also the asymptotic behavior of u and partial u all satisfy this. Um, so let's logically run what you could do for dealing with this weak now thing. So if you use um, K naught, which is the more of it as a multiplier, run the canonical way of doing your um, small data global existence, you should expect to have T plus one to the negative one without loss. So if, I mean, that is 2005. So it, well, then because of the expectation is lower than that, um, don't use multiplier. So if multiplier is not in use, you are still have first three lines, which are the full sets of commuting vector field. So that is why, I mean, you can see this, uh, the full sets of vector fields are fully used in uh, Linda block uh, in this uh, 2005 and 2010 paper. Uh, I will give more detailed thing uh, coming up. So, um, so let's, uh, finish the business with wave, and we should talk about um, Einstein equation. Um, now I'm going to talk about uh, the history of, I'm sorry for this is, uh, I don't even know this word. So it should be comp compactification. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a big joke to me. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, so, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, let's, um, let's talk about um, when you talk about this title, you immediately think about this work, and um, you consider doing the small data global existence result for Einstein vacuum equation, and you didn't really dash to using a nonlinear wave. You actually consider Bianchi equation under the maximal foliation, and maximal foliation is depicted here. I wrote like trace pi equals zero. Trace pi is the mean curvature. Of the, of the level set of T embedded in the space time MG. So um, I wrote some significant sort of work. Uh, I, well, it's, I think it's more, more influential than what I wrote there because there's the next page. So um, let's say um, it constructs um, the space time solution of the Einstein vacuum equations, which are geodesically complete globally asymptotically flat. You can't do it uh, with simplified cases because that's 
lead you to a flat trivial solution, you have to construct it dynamically. And so this dynamically is uh, well, a long story. Okay, and the second thing is um, then after this is done, you find, okay, I have a large set of generic data which are fine, asymptotic, strongly asymptotically flat, but then when they evolve, they didn't produce the peeling property in the null infinity. And this um, says, okay, so the smooth compatification um, has some, <laughs> it, which was done under the assumption of peeling should have some problem. So it's not, um, yeah, that's the, um, one of the other significance. So um, let's uh, do not talk about, uh, well, I wrote something about wave coordinates because this is history, but let's say. There is another page. Um, this is about uh, reduce the Einstein equation in wave coordinate gauge uh, because at the beginning, a lot of people believe uh, wave coordinate gauge is not uh, nice enough to uh, describe metric. So because it's like fixed the coordinate and, um, and also the equation has, has no null structure. Um, well, then, but due to um, the identification of Vic and in 2005, uh, Linda Blarodniansky first gave this uh, global stability result for a reduced Einstein equation under wave coordinate gauge. Uh, and in 2010, they um, put it in this general data set, uh, symptotically flat, and also um, for massless scalar field, not vacuum. 2005 is vacuum. Um, okay, so I list, I try my best, I, I just, it's not a complete list of uh, all the works uh, related to or about uh, uh, this global stability of Minkowski space in 3 plus 1. And uh, well, I'm not going to read it, uh, just uh, show that everything. I googled, <laughs> but um, somehow like uh, interesting thing I would say from, for us, sometimes I will still look at this um, uh, nice um, simplification, use the, um, use the scaling to replace the construction of rotation. Um, let me quickly move to the thing that I, I said. Mm. I, in my mind, what is more interesting about the book is not the two lines that I read just now. Um, well, somehow, um, um, the first thing, I mean, I, I, it seems that I'm trying to summarize the book by into two lines, which is certainly is impossible. I would say uh, what impressed me the most about this uh, 500 pages paper is about first, it constructs approximate symmetry in the dynamic Einstein vacuum space time. And the construction is on the following vector fields is rotation, scaling, time translation and more of it. Um, uh, well, certainly there is one which is missing, which is the one that we advertise for, for today's talk. Um, the, uh, the second line, which is actually wh why I was interested in this book, because I spent very, very long time on non hypersurface and this book tells me uh, how to understand non hypersurface So um, I would put, um, what is the, I mean, a lot of works are influenced by this work. I would put the, the three. So uh, the first two, uh, certainly this is about the collision of uh, uh, null hypersurface, null cones in, for relativistic uh, OLA. And, and the, the second one is formation of uh, black hole. And this two uh, all t take full two sides of this uh, work. And the other one is, uh, uh, well, not directly related, is about uh, using the technique here about non hypersurface, but here the non hypersurface is in a rough space time. So it's, uh, this, the difficulty is, uh, is on another side. Okay, so I, well, I think none of this uh, work is shorter than the original work. Uh, okay, so let me talk about. Um, the other side of the equation, we talk about Einstein already. I talk about wave. We haven't talked about Clyde Gordon. So uh, while well, I'm writing Clyde Gordon equation to the simplest form, th this is in the in Minkowski space time, and this m is Minkowski metric. Okay. So um, I would. Uh, this is the work that we actually um, try to recover in the curved space time. Um, Okay, so what is the issue? Why do, uh, so uh, let me first 
point out this problem itself has some issue with S, the scaling. The scaling vector field doesn't get along with this Clyde Gordon operator. When you commute it, the right side pops out a uh, two box, uh, <laughs> two box M. And if it's two uh, multiple of the Clyde Gordon operator, you're fine. Okay, so uh, in this way, you don't use scaling vector field as a commuti commuting vector field for Clyde Gordon equation, even for the linear one. And the second thing is, okay, so once one vector field is missing, if you do kleinman sobolev the right side uh, is, is the, it heavily rely on the right side has the full set of vector bundle of the, on the vector field, then you just can't use it. So the good thing is, okay, you can have a modification, have a very interesting way of doing Sobolev embedding. You do Sobolev embedding on hyperboloids and use Lorentz boost only. So if you, you say a, a simple equation, does the simple equation has a geometry? Yeah, I think free wave and uh, Clyde Gordon equation, they have s different geometries. Um, and hyperboloid is deeply tied to um, Clyde Gordon. Um, okay, so now we are facing the situation that uh, scaling cannot be used, and uh, we tried, multiplier also cannot be used. So you are going to run, if you do stability Minkowski under wave coordinate gauge, you are about to run the scheme by Linda Blatt Ronyansky without using scaling vector field. This is what the essence of the problem if you run wave coordinate gauge. Um, okay, let's. Uh, am I doing this too fast? Uh, okay, it's, it's okay for you, I know. <laughs> okay, so I wrote uh, this talk has been done once. <laughs> Uh, in Stony Brook at the beginning of this year, and um, two of the organizers of this conference, uh, Philip and uh, Sergio, were all there in my talk and uh, looking at the same slides. I'm sorry for not upgrading it too much. Uh, okay, so um, this is the thing that I, uh, my collaborator and I, and Lars actually at the very beginning, showed us. Um, this is uh, summarized about Einstein Clay Gordon uh, from. Uh, Linda Blatt Ronyansky. So we put the, all this key observation from Linda Blatt Ronyansky here, and let me explain what this thing is about. So Psi 1 and Psi 2 uh, denote metric. Psi 1 denote the better component of metric. This metric is the, uh, the uh, what I mean metric is not really the metric, it's the difference of the actual Einstein metric with the Minkowski metric. So. Um, Psi 1 is the good, better component, and Psi 2 is the bad component. Better component means uh, tangential to component to the, uh, tangential to the cone, so uh, L or uh, angular component. So Psi 2 is the transversal component, L bar component. So uh, if I put parenthesis 1, means either better component or derivative along better direction. So if you look at uh, the equation system, in particular, addressing this metric. The first line modulus this Clyde Gordon term. You look at this. This is a standard a null form. In my mind, it's zero. Okay. So the second line, if you look at it. Okay. I'm sorry for dropping all the cosine in your term. I keep one here. And um, if you look at this, this term is it means better component of the derivative of better component of the metric square or good derivative of just metric square. Um, that is actually a slightly better structure than a typical Vic now uh, condition. It's, it's not that like partial T phi square. Um, so this is slightly better. Um, okay, so what is the reason that I put a phi dot double uh, Double a partial square of phi here is this is uh, this was originally get us like stuck for long, and um, um, this is uh, the Clyde-Gordon part. Okay, so I drop uh, for Einstein part and make it like trivial because later on I only focus on saying something about this. Okay, so now I slightly uh, say something about the setup. So I will, in particular, say something about the. Uh, Support of phi. <coughs> so 
sorry. Whoa. <laughs> okay, it's so sensitive. Um, so we will consider the Kai Gordon part has compact support data, compact, compactly supported within radius one, and the Einstein part um, is uh, is still like this. Schwarz shear outside and um, has this Einstein vacuum and Einstein Kai Gordon inside in the in the center and uh, merge to Einstein vacuum and Schwarz shear outside. So this is our uh, design our design for the initial data set. Um, okay, and we assume the M in the Schwarzschild metric is small, uh, smaller than epsilon, and is Schwarzschild outside the ball of radius two. Uh, okay, so if if this phi is changed to partial, uh, this psi is changed to partial psi, meaning the metric is upgrade, upgraded from like psi to just partial psi is actually simple. So you can actually use the null result, just do it directly. Uh, so it's actually done by Katayama. Um, yeah, this actually is the paper that Lars asked us to read, but actually I, <laughs> we didn't really use it. Uh, let's, let's go for um, this, v, this term is what you get, we get stuck with at the very beginning. So uh, why? Uh, let's say something about energy estimate. During, uh, if you do a standard energy estimate, which is about to give you this, the boundedness of this two quantity in terms of initial data, and you're about to have a lot of term on the right side, I pick one term and drop all others. And this term, uh, I should put a direct dot here, uh, just dot instead of a star. Uh, this term is derived by, is com it comes from this one being differentiated uh, n times in z. There is one term left. Okay, so it's, it's the issue of what is the expectation for the decay of z psi, the vec commuting vector field falling on the metric, and what is the expectation? So if you just directly copy the estimate from Linda Blatt Roniansky, you get such a decay rate, and this u is almost the one in the asymptotic, uh, is in the causal boundary, and uh, sorry, in here. Uh, I should put something like, uh, it's, it's, it's small in the boundary, and it's close to t when you're looking at um, this region. So this is something could be bounded, just bounded, okay, and um, if, well, the strategy, strategy in Linda Blaronyansky is to get this term, absorb this u, you pair this u to that term and take L2, and it's, it's done. <laughs> uh, then you get 1 over t epsilon, which is good enough to use ground wall with epsilon loss. And, but Clay Gordon uh, term, does it take this weight of u? Uh, the answer is no. I will tell you in the next slides, due to the missing uh, vector field, which is S, and also the, you can't use multiplier, due to this fact, two facts. And the, the thing that Lars asked us to read is this paper, and we, we just realized that this paper actually can be improved a bit. So um, if you directly use what you, ha you got from Lindeblatt and combine one estimate in Katayama's paper, and which is an L infinity L infinity estimate, and you immediately get improvement, and you have a fixed loss, which is consistent with the energy loss. So, um, but yeah, at that time we are at under borderline, and all the time just seeing this fixed loss without any <laughs> way of getting around it. So um, then, okay, the, the, the trick is, well, using Katayama and Linda Blaronyansky, you're very close, but always losing. Okay, so yesterday I received a message of uh, uh, our organizer, Philip Lefloch. Um, he told me um, he has a paper which posted in archive a couple of days ago uh, on the stability result of uh, Einstein massive scalar field uh, under wave coordinate gauge, and I, I have to, have time to read, so I take a look. So I have to summarize, I need to mention something. Uh, we'll just, uh, I have a list of uh, a bit of things that I need to mention. So I took it, uh, we, we actually look at the paper. Um, so the Einstein part, 
is consistent with this one. So um, I think it, uh, Han, uh, Lina Blaronyanski has done the best job of exploring the structure in Einstein equation. Uh, although the paper name it differently, but the structure is the same as Hans and Igor. And the second thing, but which is more interesting to us, is this, is this point. We were stuck at this point, depressed for long. And OK, so um, the game of uh, this work is, OK, we can. It looks to me, it looks to us like, I, I can't say that much because I don't have enough time to read. OK, so it looks that this delta, this representation, L infinity, inf L infinity estimate can be improved a bit so that you can conquer this delta loss by a smaller loss. And then you try to run the scheme to close your energy argument with smaller loss. And this is, sounds possible because of this. So in the framework of Hans and Ego, um, you, the initial data you allow you uh, the smallest assumption added on capital N many derivatives, large N. So in this way, you have a lot of room to create a high-low energy hierarchy. So somehow, if you are brave enough to allow your Cly Gordon to lose to the energy of Cly Gordon to grow, t to the half, and it's possible to be closed. So this is what happened, what I read from the, from the paper. If, I, if <laughs> I'm supposed to say more, I can't. I mean, this is, time is too short for <laughs> Maru's this paper. OK, so, um, but at the moment when we start. Sorry. Uh, yeah, 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 yes, yeah. yes, exactly. So um, let's say I'm uh, okay. So facing this loss, what we did at that time is to create a new geometric, uh, new geometric things, which to get to, which get us to completely away, get away from the loss. So you don't have loss by doing something. Um, very long, but different and new. Um, so before talking about the new things, I'm going to first review the geometry in the Minkowski space-time on hyperboloids and the vector fields in hyperboloid. So let me first write down the explicitly what hyperboloid is in Minkowski space. And then, uh, okay, so I write the scaling again. And the booster vector field, uh, I explicitly write it it's the it's tangent to hyperboloid, and um, okay. So uh, S is the is orthogonal to hyperboloid. Actually, I have a picture in the next page, but uh, <laughs> there is no picture here. Okay. So I define a radial vector field by doing the combination over this uh, boost vector field. I have radial uh, this this kind of vector field. Okay. If the purpose of doing this is I want to. Uh, get the connection between S omega and LL bar. And I do a small calculation. I find this relation this is a constant multiple. OK, so if you cross out S, the game is like, if that, there's nothing here, and you don't, have the bar, you don't have U attached to L bar, you don't have U bar attached to L, and there is no weight to be put on L or L bar at all. That is the consequence of missing uh, that multiply and missing s. So uh, use Katayama. Um, but OK, so n that's not the only way. Uh, well, you, you have to beat the loss. That's the problem. So, uh, but you might wonder what we do. We actually construct in a curved space time a true, for us, from our point, it's a true uh, Lorentz boost. So, but you may wonder, why do you need a true Lorentz boost? We have a Lorentz boost in Minkowski, just borrow it. So you look at this expression, it's so good. If you just do uh, the square and sum them up, and it has a good weight paired with the angular derivative and some sort of nice weight paired with the covariant derivative. This is Minkowski covariant derivative on Minkowski for, uh, hyperboloid. So this is the nice feature of the boost. But when you do differentiation, it's not that nice. So I go back to copy what I did in the previous page, but I copied it in a geometric way. So you look at this. This is the uh, deformation tensor 
in this Einstein's uh, massive scalar field space time relative to Minkowski uh, boost. Okay, so I rewrite the energy, uh, the error integral for energy estimates. I'm about to run the same game, but then, okay, I decide to change the frame a bit. I need to give a, like a split uh, of the frame due to this hyperboloid. So uh, let me first introduce some notation of the hyperboloid frame. So if you look at the scaling, and I play with uh, this length, rho, and then I just normalize the scaling by rho and together b. This b is actually the time-like union normal of hyperboloids. And I also can normalize the boost in terms of uh, t. I get a, a frame tangent to the hyperboloids. So now I get a frame. B is uh, timeline union normal and EM is uh, nicely tangent to uh, hyperboloid. So if you run the same estimate, you will have the same issue of losing a, del a, a delta loss. And then we put, we decide to have such a thing. We construct a new R, a new B, a new EM, um, consequently new EM, such that pi BB is zero. If this is zero, this painful term is zero, then uh, we can actually have no, no loss. Basically, you, are, you have a lot of room. You can safely integrate. So um, then, actually, what we actually can do, I certainly will not run this uh, energy estimate again, just to point out there is a, a ten orthogonal component or transversal component of the, uh, of the hyperboloid is the bad, uh, bad direction, which doesn't take any weight. If it's tangential, it takes t. And if it's orthogonal, uh, the derivative is bad. That's why we call it b. Uh, OK, so um, this is the b direction. The direction is nice, actually, it's along the straight line on Minkowski space. And this is our hyperboloid. Now, uh, let's see. Um, for the next page, I'm going to uh, show, the, show the effect, show the result of this uh, construction. It's not the construction, it's the consequence. So um, by, do, by introducing foliation of intrinsic hyperboloids in the Lorentz and space-time, we can construct a nice set of boost vector fields. And um, these vector fields, satisfy such, such uh, well, identity. Um, why I call it nice? Because the Li R derivative of the deformation tensor of the boost, no matter how many order you put, as long as it has one bad component, is zero. So um, if at this point, OK, so we actually still try to go back to recording it, but uh, it doesn't seem to be, <laughs> it still seems to be losing an epsilon. So um, then we actually think we are geometrically ready to do Bianchi and under maximal foliation. Um, so, but before doing that, we have to think about the possibility. Uh, I said, Clyde Gordon <coughs> th is, is, is not compatible with multiplier approach. So that is still the same issue. If you consider Bianchi equation with uh, this, you are going to run by Robinson energy. That is a multiplier approach. So that's still a problem. Um, the, the hope is that we actually have uh, a better equation, which is Bianchi equation. Yeah, still Einstein, but it's much nicer. OK, so once we, we figure out uh, this multiplier issue, we actually started to do it religiously every day. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, now I start to uh, give the setup. And, um, well, I, I don't, I mean, I'm not sure how much detail I, I can give. It's, it could be very long. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, well, this, uh, well, sort of restart again. We consider, uh, let mg be the globally hyperbolic um, Space time, which means it can be foliated by level set of sigma t of time function t. And we decompose partial t in terms of uh, the future directed time, uh, future directed union normal to sigma t. 
And in this way, you can introduce uh, n, which is Lopp's function, and shift uh, vector field, uh, which uh, is tangent to uh, sigma t. Um, then you also can define a second fundamental form uh, of sigma t in this uh, space time. And this d it denotes the covariant differentiation of g in uh, the space time. So uh, pi is going to be a uh, second fundamental form. Uh, okay. So, um, well, uh, one gauge condition is, ad is addressing the shift. We prescribe the gauge condition should be four equation. We prescribe three here uh, on the shift, uh, asking it to be zero. So then you write the, write the metric directly, and, and then you write Einstein equation in terms of the evolution equation of metric evolution equation of uh, um, second fundamental form and its evolution equations together with constraint equations. And uh, I have said trace pi is the mean curvature of the sigma t in M and other uh, is the, this type of covariant derivatives relative to the read, uh, induced metric uh, G on the sigma, uh, on the three dimensional manifold sigma t. Um, so a sort of uh, uh, standard uh, setup and solving this uh, now you see this y equals zero and trace pi equals zero are four <coughs> equation together so at this point you get a well determined uh, equation, equation system and um, which is Einstein equation then uh, you plug in this trace pi equals zero to the previous page and then take trace and you can get the equation for laps. And further, you can also uh, keep playing such thing. You can get Kodati equation for a second fundamental form. Um, so that is the um, basic set of equation we are using. And um, so this part, um, we are taking the, mm, the framework of uh, the s setup of the data uh, from Linda Blatt Ronyansky, um, we are still considering there are certain certainly a reason that we can only considering such a thing. So um, we the the data initial data set uh, g naught pi naught phi uh, because phi has to be in so far technically we can only do compass support. So we prescribe um, Kyle Gordon uh, in the radius less than equal to one. And outside of radius two, um, the spatial metric has to be uh, the G I, G0 ij has to be cons uh, coincide with this short sure metric, the spatial part of the short sure metric, and we require pi equals zero for r greater than two. <coughs> and uh, we, all f we also prescribe laps. Um, then, um, okay, so now. Mm, <laughs> Here is our um, requirement of uh, how many in initial assumption we added, how many derivative we are using. Okay, so um, it's going to be smallest assumption on a set of bell robinson energy on wire tensor. I'm using uh, and a set of energy for Clyde Gordon, and and also smallest about ADMS. So. I'm using subscript 3, 4 to denote how many commuting vector fields I'm using to define this energy. And for Clyde Gordon parts, uh, this means actually five derivative on Clyde Gordon. This means three derivative on wire tensor uh, as an initial data. Uh, small. And uh, I didn't give you a complete. Uh, set of uh, energy because it's, uh, it's going to be a various versions, a various uh, type of estimates. Uh, so let me just mention this. Okay, the result under that smallest assumption, um, the result is there exists a, glo a unique globally hyperbolic smooth geodesically complete solution uh, foliated with level set of a maximal time function t with the properties that uh, there is a constant which give you such bound with certain growth. And uh, I can say a bit, of, analyze a bit of what this buckle of things are. So um, this means the highest order energy 
has epsilon growth. Oh, first of all, I have to say, uh, we, do two, we do energy estimates on hyperboloids, which is denoted by, uh, um, labeled by rho, and we also do energy estimate on maximal slice, which is labeled here by T. And um, for the, the large, the, the various, the collection of energies, the top, the highest order has small growth. And there is a type of energy which is sharp. If you go one order below, you're taking advantage of a bounded, uh, a control, and uh, something under control over the higher order. And, but there are, a set, there is a set of which, a set of energy which is bad. It grows every order, and you see this growth every order. And, um, but you also, it has another use, uh, in particular, to control the geometry on sigma t. So that's why I list it here, uh, in particular, for uh, level set of t. And uh, this is consistent with that, uh, same type of energy, sharp on sigma t. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, well, I can't give you the definition of uh, everything, but I will give you uh, first well we are integrating, and the next thing is the fall of the curvature component. Um, so uh, I actually draw a picture. This is the picture that's uh, in the 85 uh, paper of uh, Kleidemann, um, where you have uh, initial data uh, on the hyperboloids, and you integrate uh, in this, well, there is a cone, a flat cone uh, intersected here, and you integrate in, the hyper, in this blue region. And we actually, I mean, if we are doing similar things. We uh, do up to sigma t, uh, the last slide, pink one. And to up to there, we do hyperboloid foliation all the time. And for energy over there, the error integral is still foliated by hyperboloid foliation. Um, so this is a naive picture in Minkowski space. And I have a final page, which is the actual uh, painful page, uh, picture um, in terms of the intrinsic foliation of hyperboloids. Um, you have some modification to do in order to put this thing together. So um, I'm not going to get you, uh, bother you by this right now. So I give you the fall off of the y component. And this u is not the optical function. This u is a natural replacement of optical function, but there's no optical function in the work. Um, so, uh, well, I list these things. This, the first column, column is from the sharp energy. And uh, there is some improvement uh, of, on the other side of the energy. I don't have enough time to. Uh, I still have, okay, I'll try. Um, so I, and for Clyde Gordon part, um, the, this phi and R phi, the boost derivative of phi, achieves the sharp estimate. And if you add one more derivative, you lose an epsilon, but it's still a t to the negative 3 half. Uh, lose an epsilon. Uh, okay, so I'm, <laughs> This is also too ambitious. I'm not going to talk about too much about this. So uh, what uh, in Christodoulou climate um, is uh, you do this uh, energy, you define Barrow Robinson energy and do uh, energy estimates in terms of Barrow Robinson uh, in, this, uh, in, in this way. So, um, well, <laughs> I don't want to read it. So you have energy momentum um, defined by attaching different multipliers. The first slot is reserved for the normal, the future directed normal of the surface that you are doing your energy estimate on, you reserved for that. And the three other slots are free for you to play with multiplier. Okay, and also there are other things that you can play. It's about derivative on the wire tensor. You are free to choose something without, multi without uh, weight, which is like Li T. And and something with weight, which is like rotation vector field, um, but you have to construct the rotation vector field in the curve of space time. That is the painful thing. So um, here, these two lines, uh, in particular, it is lines ad addressing, they are all addressing the interior estimate. So uh, let me, uh, I, I explain this, uh, how to do that. You just do uh, in a divergent theorem, and you get energy and flux. 
Um, so I would uh, analyze a bit about this multiplier thing, uh, issue, possible issue with multiplier. You can sort of uh, first um, make very gentle multiplier. Do not uh, expect too much, just try to get it close. And the second thing is at one moment you have to play a trick. Um, so the first thing is if you directly use the previous slides, you will find um, the weight is too much for Clyde Gordon to take. So the thing then is we, dis we certainly don't use K as multiplier. That's uh, 1K means T squared. That's a lot of weight. Um, Clyde Gordon doesn't take it. So we put less weighted multiplier to the energy momentum. And to compensate this less weight, in order to get enough decay, we use vector field, commuting vector field, to take weight. So if the commuting vector field doesn't take weight, you have to drop it. So Li T is certainly not qualified to be the commuting vector field and for the wire tensor. And on the other hand, rotation seems to be good, but rotation itself is not enough. You need to have a transversal direction, which is transversal to the sphere. So that means scaling or boost should be used but al already scaling should be totally avoided as a commuting vector field if you co consider Clyde Gordon. So in immediate scaling, there is only one thing which is left, that is boost vector field. So you construct a boost vector field in the curved space-time. Um, that also comes to the same. Uh, and the other side is from the paper by Sergio, uh, by Kleinman, and this side is this analysis. Okay, so the other you think about the feasibility of the problem. Um, actually, um, Bianchi equation, if you play with first order derivative, you see a lot of structure. Uh, um, well, I would just quote one, uh, which is the null structure that I, we constantly use. We try to play, decompose everything in terms of this structure. Um, that is called via current. Um, this is uh, some abstract thing. It's a three tensor, uh, which uh, satisfy Bianchi equation and also anti-symmetric about the second and third component and traceless about the first and second component. And so because of the anti-symmetry, so it's, it's very good when you play, when you estimate it. Um, you see a lot of error terms and source terms taking this form or you write it into this form. Um, uh, the thing is, if you have null condition uh, but you have no null hypersurface in this we, we don't have no hypersurface in our work. And uh, in Kleinman Christodoulou, one you have two parts. One is symmetry, one is null cone. And the second part is in our work is one part is symmetry, one part is hyperboloid foliation. <coughs> um, so replacing the intrinsic null cone by intrinsic hyperboloids. And um, then I certainly, this thing is going to be, if no null hypersurface, there is possible that the question is, where is your null frame? If there is no null frame, how to play with your null condition? So um, null frame still can be recovered. I, I just use the standard hyperboloidal frame in Minkowski. I do simple calculation and look at the right side. It gets LL bar and pair with weight. Not that bad. Okay, so uh, then you see uh, the wire tensor decomposition, the wire tensor into null frame makes sense and also um, uh, the null form can be treated in terms of null, f null frames. So, but, uh, okay, so if it seems, it seems that uh, the, the two foliation are coordinating, actually it's not. So if you look at this, <laughs> It may not mean anything to you, but if I want to estimate a T derivative, which T is the time-like uninormal of maximal foliation, if I want to estimate such a thing on the deformation tensor of intrinsic uh, Lorentz boost, I write down dt, and I know that I have this quantity has a meaning, I have an equation for that. And this has a bound I'm able to do. But then what is uh, this has, if I directly copy that line, replace everything in terms of the intrinsic <coughs> ansatz, and I'm having T over rho. 
What does that mean? It means t to the half growth if you compute it. So whatever you try to gain, you gain it and then you lose half. That's why we have an epsilon loss. Um, well, certainly there is no calculation can be provided here. Um, try to say uh, in the last five minutes, I, I can't finish this. But let's let's let me try to say uh, something. Okay, first of all, is uh, if you think about the problem, you try to bound deformation tensor. Uh, for instance, the deformation tensor of T, the deformation tensor of boost, also the second fundamental form of the hyperboloids. And uh, also, when y component and massive scalar fields, you want to have decay estimate for all of them. Um, the decay estimate will be derived by uh, doing Sobolev embedding on hyperboloids. Um, that is the uh, Sobolev embedding on hyperboloids. And the two, three, the two other things is, the, is also the standard one that you can see in, is, the, uh, yeah, is on the sigma t. Um, I'm not going to <laughs> analyze what these derivatives are. Um, what I want to say is you have a chart of uh, counting how many derivatives uh, in, to bound, uh, in order to bound one end, and you need for the other end in order to bound one end. So let me say a bit about uh, control second fundamental form and control boost. So uh, boost deformation tends to the boost. So I would say usually you have transport equation and quadratic equation to play with. And then um, I want to have two order derivative on pi on this pi. So I start to think of what I'm hiding I'm heading to. So I run this game and then eventually I find here due to this, I can't explain this. So I just want to say this line says if I can manage, these two quantities are equal footing, if I can manage using the same order R derivative on I Y tensor to bound Clyde Gordon, and on the other hand, if I can use the same order R derivative on Clyde Gordon to bound the energy of uh, Y tensor, I'm done. But unfortunately, that's not the story. If you compute the first order derivative, it's due to multiply, due to source, you find, okay, in order to bound I, I need I plus one. <laughs> always, always. So then, um, there's, there's certainly some, to some I, you have to stop this loose. So um, in this place, we use Einstein equation. Well, certainly it's a long uh, procedure, but yeah, that's really, um, if you see this, you start the, start the whole program. Yeah. Um, okay, so, and also, uh, last of two minutes. <laughs> uh, sorry for taking up your time. Okay, so I'm talking about this, uh, we control energy with epsilon loss, and we also, certainly for that, we have to have, uh, well, energy hierarchy, and this is for, well, this is constant, you see, if energy has lost, you see this inequality pops up before you do uh, your final uh, line. Uh, you have this inequality and you have, do it by ground wall, that's it. Integrate from one to uh, S, S is certain time parameter. And this decay rate, if it can only be de derived by your energy Y, by Sobolev embedding, and this energy S may fails because your expectation of y is with loss, and one over s cannot be actually achieved. That's going to be one over less s with loss. So uh, you you won't have this. Um, you won't have this line. It just fails. And but the strategy of doing this usually is decoupling. So uh, that's what I said. Um, you try to get this decay not from y, but from other things. If you can do it from lower order energy, which could be, which what I write here, could be sharp, and use higher order to bound lower order, it's fine. And or, the other uh, aspect of the hierarchy is you play with multiplier. If you bound it by another energy, which is defined by using another multiplier, then you're fine. So, um, there are two aspects of energy hierarchy. So, I wouldn't uh, give you a complete list of the Bell robins and energy, um, but I would say a few lines about it. So, um, if you consider, <laughs> sorry, um, 
well, if you just consider how to define energy, leave one, uh, the Bell Robinson energy has four slots, leave one for the future directed, for the time, for the union normal of the uh, surface, and the other three, you spot what kind of, what's po what is the possible multiplier you are going to use, which isn't that much, which are not that much, and you do the combination. And you do the full combination, various combination, and bound their energies up to two or third order. That's the complete chart of our energy estimate. So, and then, um, then, I mean, I'd say the more hyperboloidal the frame or the multiplier you're using, the easier you can get it. But, well, if you, if you, it's easier, you want to be more ambitious, so you put more weight. That's why you see uh, overweighted. And all, uh, all energy has epsilon growth, but there's a, a sharp energy, uh, which is also very crucial. Um, so, <laughs> one minute for the <laughs> difficulty. I actually can't explain that picture. So, um, for the for addressing boost, you have to have a complete comparison um, between your intrinsic boost with the Minkowski boost, and boost and rotation. I mean, in Minkowski space, are not. I mean, I. I mean, it's something nice. And this is, if you do a direct calculation in Minkowski metric, the commutator is zero, and this commutator is. Uh, that. So, how to recover that in the uh, curve of space-time. And, um, and hyperboloids are very um, singular. I'm not, uh, I'm running over my time, so that is the, uh, the picture that I, I don't have time. So, basically, you first have to figure out where you are, you are doing your energy estimates. And in the energy, in the wave zone, uh, you need to control your Optical function. Sorry, that's <laughs> that's for me. And for this, we actually use the comparison argument, which uh, I learned from the formational shock book. Yeah. Thank you. Well, let me remind anyone with questions or remarks to wait for the microphone. Other questions or remarks. Directly say this to me. <laughs> so there is, um, as you presumably know, um, um, another result of Kleinerman where he prove, improved decay for uh, Klein Gordon fields, where you have somehow yeah. stronger V V decay, but you lose some U decay. Is yeah, yeah. it not something that could be of any use, or do you use it perhaps? No, or? no, it's it's very close to the like cone. We can't do that. You have to be away from that. Yeah, you know, I cut it. <laughs> yeah. Further questions or remarks? Well, if not, thank you very much. Thank you.